being a family. Being a family. And, 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 and to start us off, we're going to go to Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. We're going to read one verse. And this is what the Lord of God declares. So now you Gentiles, listen, are no longer strangers and foreigners. You are citizens along with all. Someone say all. With all of God's holy people, you are members of God's family. Amen. You are, say, I'm a member. I'm a card-carrying member. I'm a card-carrying member. Now, 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 today, I want to begin with this idea of being a family because it's difficult for some of us in this day and time because when I say family, many of us have different thoughts or ideas in our mind about what this means to be a family. Some of us, if I just say family, you think of mom and dad and, and the kids coming up together. That, that's what I grew up to live in, and that's what I see when I, when I hear the word family. Others, you say family, and it may be a, a single dad raising girls. That's the situation that he's in, and that's what you think of because you might have been one of the girls or you might be that dad. But that's what you think of when you hear the word Family, you may be a single mom doing the same thing. You may be a grandmom and pop-pop. Let's be real. Nowadays, grandparents are raising their children sometimes. I mean, their grandchildren. So it may be a grandparent raising children. And when I say family, that's the first thing that comes to your mind, this scenario. It may be an uncle and an aunt that stepped in. It may be a neighbor due to something going on in someone's life, and they had to bring you into their family. They had to bring you into the fold, and now your family. And then for others, for others, when I say the word family, all they see is themselves. No mom that they know of, no dad that they know of, no aunts, no uncles, traveled through foster care, get 18, at 18 you age out. They give you money, but then you continue to live your life. And all they know is my family is me. I've seen it. My family is what I can carry in a trash bag. That's my family. Those are my memories. Those are things that I carry with me. So whatever that idea, when I say family, whatever that sparks in your mind, whatever background, whatever situation it does, I want you to be assured that whatever the situation may be, bad or good, as a body of Christ, as a place that, that you can come to, that you have family here. Amen? I, I, I want that to, 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 to really resonate within us that that when people walk through our doors or when when people come to us that we operate and we function as a family it, it's the ecclesia that's the church uh the word ek means out and actually that word ecclesia means i uh, mean actually and ek, actually kalia means to call so actually in in those words actually we're the called out ones we've been called out of this world for a purpose for a reason and that's to share the love of Jesus Christ and this family of God that, that Paul is talking about in Ephesians. But a part of this different views of, of what family is, sometimes it's hard for our minds to, to look at or, or, or think about family because of our experiences in a physical family. And they, they, tell, they tell you that, that your experience in the physical will sometimes and normally dictate how you see it in the spiritual. So if you had a horrible father that didn't listen, wasn't there, was, was not compassionate, was very rule and, and, and law oriented, then when you look at God, that's the way that you view him. It may be that mother that, that wasn't coddling. 
I thank God for my wife. Because <laughs> I step up in the door waving the 4-4. When it's time to go to bed, it's time to go to bed. But then my wife comforts me and says, baby, don't go in there. Don't go in there like that. She prepares me. Silent, going there smoothly. They, 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 they want their prayers at night. I thank God for my wife. But, but, but we as the family, as the ecclesia, as the church, I want us to understand that, that people's idea of what family is is directly dictated by the physical families that we're attached to. And once again, we, we're, we're a hot church, right? We're a hot church, right? Honest, open, and transparent. Some of us, like I said, didn't come from the best families. And there's a word called dysfunctional family. <laughs> this is an, an, an impaired or abnormally functioning family where some or all the roles in the family operate outside of themselves. In other words, the dad or the father has relinquished his role as leader. The children dictate the entire environment of the room and, and the wife or, and, and or girlfriend in no way, shape, or form will ever submit, obey them because you, you ain't my father. <laughs> it, it may be a blended family, and we think that blended families are new, but, but blended families are in the Bible. A blended family where two or more families are under the same roof. Either the mother has children that aren't the fathers, or the fathers have children that aren't the mothers, and they may even have some children between them. It, 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 it was very, very uh, evident during the times of Joseph. You know, uh, 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 he was a part of a blended family. Multiple mothers, multiple children, multiple baby mama drama. I don't see how they did it in the Bible. They wanted multiple wives. I love the one. And we are fighting right now. We are getting things together because we want the best for our children. So we, we we're doing this together. I can't imagine having 15 beautiful women in my house. Like, I wouldn't know what to do. See, I shaped that, right? You saw how I went back and round and curved around. But this idea of blended family is very real in our day and time. There's next the functioning family. This, this type of family has a father or a husband that brings home the bacon, pays all the bills, but then he goes home and goes to his secret space, to the basement or that, 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 that room, and he doesn't spend any time with his family, just functioning. The, 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 the mother or the, or the wife cares more for the children than she does for the husband or the father, just functioning. The children having no relationship, no real relationship with the parents because nowadays children are being raised by tablets and cell phones and television, just functioning. And while, while this type of household, I don't, I'm not asking anyone to raise their hand, but this type of household, from what I've seen, is, is very common today. This type of functioning household can be just as bad, if not worse, than a dysfunctional household. But the family that we're striving for is that one right there at the bottom. It's that biblical family. Remember, we talked about being a man, but it wasn't just about being a man. It was about being a biblical man. We talked about being a woman, but it wasn't just about being a woman. It was about being a biblical woman. But what is this biblical family? A biblical family is a family that's not only operating in their God-given roles, but they're using God's word to lead and guide their lives. How do I parent? Let me go to... God's word. How am I a better husband? I go to God's word. How am I a better wife, a better child, a better student? I go to God's word. Children obeying their parents. Oh my goodness, let's, let's hear that again. Children obeying their parents. Let's hear that one more time. Children <laughs> obeying their Oh, let me get some of that right there. Wives respecting Respecting their husbands, because who here knows that, that, that a, a little respect goes a long way? 
I was just talking to my mom just the, just this week, and I was sharing with her how um, I've never I never saw her. Not saying I didn't hear it at home, but I never saw my mom in public dishonor my father, whether she agreed with everything with what he was doing or what he had done or not. It's not the fact that they didn't go home and they, can I say, uh, discussed it between themselves behind closed doors, but respecting the fathers. Husbands striving to obtain the mark of, 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 of loving, his wife, loving his wife as Christ loved the church. And, and every time I do bib, uh, premarital counseling, I show the fact that, that you want to step up, you want this role, I want you to know exactly everything that comes with this role. And, and, and that is you bearing the cross. That, that Christ died for the church. As a husband, are you willing to die for your wife and for your family? And it's not just the physical. It's, it's saying, like, I want, I want Burger King tonight. But my daughters want Dairy Queen. It's something small. But you know what? I'm going to do that for them. Dying itself is, is, is us saying that as a husband that, that, that I care more for you than I do for myself. As long as we're following God's word. But the biblical family is what we're formed to be, both in the physical and spiritual forms. But to be it, we need to see it. To be it, we need to see it. So what we're going to do, we're going to walk through Ephesians chapter 2 and see how Paul lays out the blueprint for being a biblical family in today's world, both physical and spiritual. So we're going to walk through it, Ephesians chapter 2, and we're going to find out the way, a, a, as a biblical family, what does a biblical family remember? What does a biblical family remember? And the first thing that Paul shows us in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 through 12, is that a biblical family remembers what we were. Someone say were. Past tense. What we were. Verse 11 through 12 says, don't forget that you Gentiles used to be outsiders. You are called uncircumcised heathens by the Jews. You were proud of their of who, Jews who were proud of their circumcision, even though it affected only their bodies. Watch this, not their hearts. Verse 12, in those days, you were living apart from Christ. You were excluded from citizenship among the people of Israel, and you did not know the covenant promises God made to them. You, loved, you lived in this world without God and without hope. As a biblical family, I don't want you to forget what you were. I, 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 it's, it's just the fact that we, at one time, we were separated from God with no hope. All of us. There's not, nothing wrong with remembering where you've come from, but the only thing is that I don't want you to live in those memories. I, I don't want you to be like Lot's wife, who was told to come out. But she looked back with a desire. If you read that word, you see Abraham actually looked at Sodom as it was going down, and he didn't turn to Saul. She looked back in a different type of way. It's the idea that, that, that reminds us that what we were is that we were people living in spiritual poverty. So because you, you, that's all that you knew, that's how you lived. You lived separated from Christ, excluded from citizenship. You were foreigners in a foreign nation without hope and without God in this world. I want you to remember that. Why? Because it should drive everything that you do moving forward. I remember sleeping in a car, not having a place to stay. I remember those things. I remember the mistreatment that might have happened to me or the mistreatment that I might have caused on others. I remember these things, but I don't remember them to live in them. I'm reminded every time I go home and open up the key 
to my house that I used to sleep in a car. I'm reminded uh, that the mistreatment that might have happened to me as I kissed my little daughters to sleep every night and them saying, Daddy, you haven't prayed yet. I remember those things. It's nothing wrong remembering where you were. Paul is describing that outside the family, outside of the church, remembering who you were was not a bad thing. But you have to be able to say, I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, <laughs> but now I see. And that's a testimony. That's something that you can share with someone else. That's the realness. That's the hotness that comes in, in, in the lives that people see when we're talking with them. So if a biblical family remembers what you were, but secondly, secondly, a biblical family remembers what we are. Ephesians 13 through 19 recognizes of the fact that, that, that you, you, I remember what I was, but now I realize what I am. I, I realize that, that I'm not living in that any longer. I'm understanding this word called reconciliation that Jesus came and did for me. This reconciliation that occurred on multiple layers and levels. That's what I am. I'm a new creation. I've been born again. That's what I am. I'm no longer that thief. I'm no longer that liar. I'm no longer that person. Now, ha do I lie sometimes still? Yes. But the conviction of Christ now where I am convicts me and now th that change happens slowly. What we are is reconciled not only to God, but first of all, we're reconciled to one another, Paul says in this verse. In verses 13 through 15, it says, but now you have been united with Christ. Once you were away from God, but now you've been brought near to him through the blood of Christ. Verse 14, for Christ himself has brought peace to us. He united Jews and Gentiles into one people when in his own body on the cross, he broke down the wall of hostility that separated us. He did this by ending the system of law with its commandments and regulations. He made peace between the Jews and Gentiles by creating in himself one new people from the two groups. That's what I am. The enemy seeks to separate us. That's his tool. That's his trick. It's been happening way before, way before any of us were born. Adam was there. But the enemy sought to trick Eve. He did it to divide. Read the Bible. Everything up to that point was good. There was only one day, and, and, and I was, we were learning in school, that there was only one day that the Bible didn't read it for yourself because it, it hit me on the face. It, it just hit me like a, like a Mike Tyson left hook. Because I, I thought every day I would learn it was good, it was good, it was good. But there was only one day when God separated the ferment from the earth. It, it was almost that, that that one day God said that I'm not saying that it's, it's bad, but, but, but it separated his presence from his creation. And, and God knew that that wasn't good. So read it for yourself. But it's the fact that, that, that through this separation happened from the beginning of time. Everything was good up to that point. But when God brought Eve into the picture and, 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 and the enemy knew the power that could happen when the family, someone say family, when the family began with a man and a woman, a husband and a wife. I want you to get this and I want you to get it good. When we think about this thing, when we think about anything, it's called the law of first mention. I'm confused about what a family looks like. Go to the Bible and see the first time it's mentioned in Scripture. That doesn't look like it did today. That's fine. It's just the fact that that's the way that God intended it to be. The moment that Eve was brought into the picture, that's when the enemy showed up. He didn't show up when, because when, Adam had a job. We think, we think that because of the fall that, that God made Adam work. 
Adam was working before the fall. He had a job. He was naming everything. Remember, he like duck, 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 goose. And what is this funny looking thing with a bill and a, I'm going to call that a platypus. He had a job before. It was when the family was created. That's when the enemy said, uh, uh-uh, I can't let this happen. I got to call the vision. So, so, so we're reconciled to each other in this family, but we're also reconciled through Jesus Christ. We're not reconciled to each other by ourselves because as long as we look at each other through our own eyes, through our own way, we will always remain separate. Always. There's differences. We all have differences. God created us that way, and I thank God for our differences. But there's a unity that comes in the family of God. There's a unity that, that comes through Jesus Christ. And it shows in verse 16 through 18, it says, Together as one body, Christ reconciled both groups to God by means of his death on the cross. And our, watch this, we had hostility towards each other. It was put to death. He brought this good news of peace to you Gentiles who were far away from him and the peace to the Jews who were near. Now all of us, now all of us can come to the Father through the same Holy Spirit because of what Jesus or Christ has done for us. Our reconciliation is through Jesus Christ. Or as the old timers say, Jesus the Christ. He's the one that's reconciled us to one another. And that's the thing that we hold on to. That's why we can come together as a body, being different, but yet unified. And that's what we have to hold on to, not ourselves, not our opinions, not our point of views, but for us to be a biblical family, we have to hold on to Christ. He's our banner. Jehovah Nisei, he's our banner. And we hold him up. Not ourselves, not our opinions. Watch this, not even our experiences. Because you know that sometimes your experiences can taint you on how you see the world, how you see yourself, and how you see others. I told you, like, you know, background, retired state police officer. I enjoyed it. Good pay. Had a gun. (laughs) Had a car. They gave me a car that I didn't have to put gas in. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus! <laughs> Loved it. But the job was creating something inside of me that wasn't me. I was became very distrusting of individuals. I was changing. My experiences were changing me. But as I leaned into Christ, knowing what he called me out of to call me into I realize that it's through Jesus Christ and through him alone that I stand where I stand today. And for us all as well, where are you? The word that God asked Adam, it wasn't about his proximity, but God was asking Adam, where are you? Because he wanted Adam to recognize the distance that was between him and God and that distance that was created from Adam. God didn't move. God was still on the throne. God was still walking through the garden. God was still functioning, but something had changed. So the question I ask for you today is where are you? Online campus, I want you to answer that, ask that question to yourselves. Where are you? Right now. Yeah, I understand where you've been. And I understand where you, I want you to know it for yourselves because Pastor Larry can't preach you happy. I can try. Well, here it goes. When you leave this place and you search God's word for yourself and you find where you are, then it brings a joy within you that, can, that passes all understanding. So where are you? Christ, Jesus brought our peace. He made our peace. And Jesus preached our peace. And at the cross, Jesus takes away all of our guilt, our sin, our shame, our greed, our fears, our doubts. And now with nothing else, Nothing can separate us from the love of God. That's where you are. We are in union. 
with the love of God. And nothing, someone say nothing. Nothing can separate you. What were you, what you were, what you are. And the last thing that this verse tells us, it brings on the idea of what we are becoming. What we're becoming. What we're becoming is we're becoming unified in Christ. It's a process. That's what sanctification is. It's a process. It's day after day after day saying, God, I messed it up. Now let's get it right. God, I need you today. I messed up. I really messed up yesterday. Oh, I, I cussed out my supervisor. Oh, I need you. I need thee. Oh, I need thee. Every second I need thee. Pass me not. Oh, come on now. Oh, Savior, I'm. Don't sound like y'all don't, don't like calling too much. Sound like you're whispering. I need you, God, because of what I'm becoming. It's the idea that, that I know what I am, but I also know what God wants me to be. I know the purpose of my life. I know the calling on my life. I, I know the, where God has placed me in this world, the change that he wants me to make. I know what I'm becoming, and I have to hold on to Jesus every day, every hour, every minute, every second. Because if I don't, I will lose my mind. The way that this world is going, you better know that you're becoming something better. And I don't care where you are. I don't care what you're doing. If you're holding on to Jesus, you have the very option, you have the very opportunity to become something better. It may not feel good, but like Campbell's Soup, it would be, thank you, it would be mm, mm, good. What are you becoming? It is the fact that, that in this particular scripture, Paul gives us three pictures that illustrate the unity of this family, the unity of the ecclesia as it continues to grow inwardly, knit together in harmony, as the church continues to grow upwardly towards heaven in holiness, as this family, as this church continues to grow outwardly around the world in witness. You are not supposed to be in these pews longer than 1130. If Pastor Larry keep here longer than 1130, say, oh, no, Pastor, we got work to do. We got work to do. We are refueled. We got work to do. God, I have to be a witness. Who here knows that we all are witnesses, we all are evangelists, we all are missionaries for Jesus. Pastor Larry, I'm a little shy. Then let your life, the life that you live, be your witness. People will ask questions, they'll, they'll see. Wait, wait a minute. Wait, whoa, 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 whoa. What happened to cursing Mike? I'm looking over here because I don't want to make it seem like I'm talking about him because that's not what he was. <laughs> Mine's a little different. That's your witness. What, 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 what happened? Oh, goodness, it's Lisa. I was going to say Lisa. I was going to say Loose Lisa because it rhymed. Loose Leslie. Is there Leslie here? No. What happened to Loose Leslie? She used to wear the clothes, and she was with every man in the neighborhood. Whatever happened to Loose? She has a witness now. I said that God changed my life. But, but it starts with the fact that, 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 that what we're becoming is that we're becoming one family. Someone say family. In verse 19, it says, so now you Gentiles are no longer strangers and foreigners. You are citizens along with all of God's holy people. You are members of God's family. Let me say that again. You are members of God's family. Watching online, you are members of God's family. We are one family. Not only are we one family, we're one foundation. Verse 20 tells us together we are his house built on the what? Foundation of the apostles and the prophets. And the cornerstone, cornerstone is Christ Jesus himself. We're built on one foundation and one foundation only. There's only one way to God. 
Jesus, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes from the Father but through me. Jesus is the foundation. Not only is the foundation, they're saying in some buildings, the cornerstone is more important than the foundation. That cornerstone is that stone that's placed and that's vital to the entire building. If you remove that cornerstone, the entire structure becomes weak. We're built on one foundation, but lastly, not only we build on one family, not only we build on one foundation, but we're built on one faith. Verse 21 through 22 says, we are carefully joined together in him, becoming. Someone say becoming. Someone say becoming. Becoming a holy temple for the Lord. Verse 22, through him, you Gentiles are also being made. I love the fact that you're being made part of his dwelling where God lives by his spirit. The one faith is us being knit together, joined together with Christ. We've been created for community. We've been fashioned for fellowship. We've been formed for a family, and none of us can fulfill God's purpose for our lives by ourselves. Understand that we are family. We need each other. God tells us that, 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 we, that we were put together, that we were joined together, that we were built together, that we are members together, that we are heirs together, that we are fitted together, that we are held together, that we be caught up together to see him again in the sky one day. We are family. We are not in it by ourselves any longer. And while our relationship with Christ is personal, it's not supposed to be private. Let me say that again, because I, I know Twitter done turned to X now, right? And now it's X. Yeah, watch, watch, watch your phone. You'll see an X on your phone now. No longer the bird, now an X. But I will say that's a tweetable moment. Your relationship with Jesus is supposed to be personal, but it's not supposed to be private. In God's family, we're connected to every other believer, and it's a connection that takes us from here through eternity. We are family. Following Christ involves belonging and not just believing. One family, one foundation, one faith. We are family. Everybody stand on your feet. Everyone stand on your feet. Everyone stand on your feet right now, right now, right now. And I want three words. I, I want my kids, I want you guys to be louder than your parents. I want my youth to be louder than everybody else. I want everyone to shout in the voice of triumph that we are family. Let's say it. One, two, three. We are family. No, oh, what would we say it again? We are family. One last time. We are family. Hallelujah. And Lord God, we thank you. We thank you that we are family. That your presence, your son Jesus Christ, has brought us together. And now we can shout with a loud voice that we are family. We remember what we were. We see where we are. And also, God, we, we ask, God, that, that you show us what we're becoming. God, use this moment, use this time to, to get the glory, God. You and you alone, God, deserve it all.